Today I'm going to talk about the uh, the drivers of solar diffusion in the developing world. I'll be looking at some of the barriers that exist and just how those barriers can be broken down and what happens as a, re as a result of doing so. The first slide that I have here is a slide that was produced by the IEA in 2002, and it shows uh, in the yellow bubbles the number of people without electricity in certain geographic areas of the developing world. According to the IEA in 2002, there are basically 1.6 billion people without electricity. So obviously, there's a huge need. Now, in terms of what people do without electricity, mainly they rely on kerosene fuel for lighting. These uh, photos here are a picture of a, of a young child carrying back kerosene from the store in Sri Lanka and kerosene lantern being used in the home at night in Sri Lanka. But obviously, kerosene has its disadvantages, one of them being that it gives off a very low light compared to an electric light. In addition, it's inconvenient, not to mention extremely unsafe. Many homes are known to burn down when a child accidentally spills a kerosene lantern. And in this slide, uh, a series of photos that I took in, in someone's house in Indonesia, he kindly showed me what it took to light a Petronax lantern. And as you can see from the process, it is highly inconvenient and just in the process itself, highly unsafe. In addition to kerosene, people often will use battery charging so that they can watch TV or listen to the radio. Simply put, what they'll do is, as this gentleman is here in, in Sri Lanka, we'll put the battery on the back of the bike and take it down to the nearest point for charging, have it charged, and then go and pick it up either that evening or the next day and use it uh, in their home until it's depleted and then take it back for charging again. Obviously, that's a, a tremendous inconvenience for those who do it. In addition to battery charging kerosene, there's an option for people to use diesel generator sets. What my experience in rural areas of the developing world is that only the more affluent tend to use diesel generator sets, and even amongst those, there's no love lost for this technology. It is uh, that people are exposed to rising costs of fuel, the high cost and hassle of maintenance, and not to mention the safety factors and the hassle factors of starting it up all the time. Because of what people use without the electricity, it's not surprising that the solar home system entered the rural energy mix in the mid 80s. The solar home system, very simply put, in the developing world is often one panel on a roof, uh, an average, you might say, 40 to 50 watts. And connected to that are lights uh, and if it's a larger system, a radio and a TV. This is a picture here from Indonesia, appealing to a customer. Not to mention the easy nature of being able to flip a switch rather than light. The advantage of a solar home system is it gives somebody light at the flip of a switch. And if you compare this light to the light that we looked at in the case of kerosene, it's obviously bright electric light, which is uh, much more um, appealing to a customer. Not to mention the easy nature of being able to flip a switch rather than light a kerosene lantern. Solar home system is also capable of running radio and TV. And you can see from this photo here, the one on the left, uh, people can run some pretty big entertainment systems off their relatively small solar home system, or, just, or the people here watching TV at night. Now, there was tremendous hope for solar when it was initially introduced, uh, or to be more specific, when it moved from being an aid-funded activity to being a commercial activity. So a, a rural energy specialist uh, postulated in 1995 the following, that the self-sustaining commercial diffusion of TV system in full competition will be with the alternative is the clearest indication that TV technology has attained a valid and significant role in the rural areas of the developing world. The rural areas of many developing countries could see a diffusion of TVs like that of radio cassettes, TVs, video recorders, and other high consumer goods. The reality, however, was that solar was very slow to diffuse. By around the year 2000, 2001, the World Bank put out a report and it estimated that roughly one million solar systems had spread over the course of roughly 15 to 20 years, only one million across uh, a potential or the, across a potential household base of about 400 million. So obviously diffusion was happening slowly, and it turns out though when you look at the diffusion many innovations, that solar was not alone. 
to quote some of the those who have written most on innovation diffusion, many technologists believe that the advantageous, advantageous innovations will sell themselves, that the obvious benefits of the new idea will be widely realized by potential adopters, and that the innovation will therefore diffuse rapidly. Seldom is this the case. Most innovations diffuse at a disappointingly slow rate. This is the typical S-curve of innovation diffusion, where you, where you have an initial slow period in the beginning, which then leads to an exponential ramping up, which then leads to then a, a decline as the technology reaches saturation. What very clearly the solar jury at the end of the 90s and in the early part of the, of the new millennium was at the bottom of this curve. Now, my research as a PhD student back in the mid-90s uh, look, was looking at why was this? Why was it that such a promising technology with so much hope and potential in, developing, in the developing world was diffusing so slowly? And as I set about to try and answer that question, I was fortunate enough to come across a whole uh, slew of, of literature known as, the, uh, known as innovation diffusion literature which really looks at what affects the rate at which various technological innovations diffuse through society. Now, this is a very, very boiled down version, but simply put, I came across four different perspectives, and these four different perspectives all had a different answer to the same question. Or rather, I could put it this way, they asked a different question by means of trying to explain why an innovation was slow or fast or diffuse. The communication perspectives asked fundamentally, do, is it attractive? Do customers perceive the technology to be attractive and suited to what they want and to their needs? The economic history perspective will look more at the technology itself and say, is it competitive economically and functionally, but mainly economically? The development perspective will say, well, that's all fine. It can be attractive. It can be competitive. But is it affordable? Can people, especially in the developing world, afford a technology that may be competitive and attractive nonetheless? And finally, there is another perspective, known as the market infrastructure perspective, which looks at is the product available and is the service available. 